Good morning. Welcome to church today. Why don't you stand with us? We're going to sing. This morning we are uh, taking communion together, so if you haven't grabbed uh, the elements from the back, you've got time to do so still. Let's praise God today. to the sun.
Why don't you turn to someone next to you and welcome them to church today?
Good morning. Oh, come on, you guys can do better than that. Good morning. So it's my uh, privilege to be able to facilitate our participation in the Lord's Supper. And I'm just uh, unfortunately coming into this season of getting a cold. Has anyone like had a cold or is like experiencing that? Yeah, so the, the NyQuil, DayQuil combination is just not sitting well. So I decided to uh, write some notes just so I can make sure that I'm saying everything that I'd like to say this morning. But first and foremost, the Lord's Supper uh, was instituted by our Lord Jesus for the church and points disciples to the great redemptive work of Christ that was accomplished on the cross. And I think today's Communion Sunday is unique in light of yesterday's Truth and Reconciliation Day, and I feel this way for two reasons. First, reconciliation is at the heart of the cross. And the Lord's Supper points us to reflect on that. Jesus does not only die as a substitute for us, but also that we may be fully reconciled to God to the point of being able to call him Father. That is a gift. Second, the Lord's Supper gifts us with the responsibility of being agents of reconciliation in this broken world. For it was shortly after the disciples shared this meal together that they would all abandon Jesus in his greatest moment of need. Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, And we all know the story. He would deny his own Lord and Savior three times. And yet the beautiful thing is, what does Jesus do? Upon his resurrection, he goes and seeks to reconcile Peter and the disciples to himself. This past week at Cedars, I had the privilege of listening to many a testimony of residential school survivors who, despite having to face such horrific atrocities, got to meet the beautiful, warm, and redemptive embrace of the real Jesus at the end of it all. Not the Jesus that was portrayed during their time there. Not the Jesus that was proclaimed to be a God of love, but shown differently by what was done to them. No, the real Jesus who would never have instituted such a horrific thing in the first place. And yet the the most incredible thing is listening to these stories of these people who have come to still embrace a relationship with Jesus, they not only enjoy uh, the gift that many of us share in having and being made right with the Father, but they have gone even further to extend their hand back to Canada, to the government, and even to the church to not only be reconciled, but to offer forgiveness, much in the same way our Lord has. And so I think that's an encouragement for us, I think it should encourage us as as Christians, if we profess to be Christians, to be agents of reconciliation as well. And so this morning as we participate and partake in communion, I want us to reflect on one thing that I heard from an indigenous man say this past week, and that was, we may not have been around for when this problem first started. We may not have been a part of the problem, but we can all be a part of the solution and how beautiful that solution could be in Christ. When it comes to participating in the Lord's Supper, Paul commands that we examine ourselves. We are to seek to see where in our hearts right now, search me, O Lord, to know where am I wrong with you. And likewise, Jesus commands us in the Gospel of Matthew that if we have anything against a brother or sister, we need to actually leave our gift at the altar and go and make things right. So I would love to just give us that time right now, just a moment between you and God, allow him to examine you, examine your heart, ask him to show you right now, Lord, right now, oh Lord, where, at, where do I sit with you? Where do I sit with my brothers and sisters? Just take a moment now to do so.
so for today's uh, participation in the Lord's Supper, I will uh, read the scriptures. We will eat both the bread and drink the juice, and then I will pray to close us off afterwards. So in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed unto you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us participate in eating of the bread and drinking of the cup. Holy God, I thank you. We thank you for the incredible gift of your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that his supper instituted to us reminds us and points us to the powerful example of love that is found in him. Thank you, Lord, that through him we can enjoy life eternal here and now with you and in the life to come. And I just thank you, Jesus and pray that you would just bless us with your presence as we continue on from here. In your name, Jesus Christ, amen. Why don't you stand? We're gonna celebrate what God's done.
sacrifice on the cross. We thank you for your amazing grace. We get to sing about that. Father, we just lift our praise high to you this morning for your good. In all things, Father, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat and the ushers can come forward and collect this morning's offering. Well, good morning. Thank you guys so much for worshiping. It's always such a joy and a delight to sing together. Um, I'm just up here to quickly uh, highlight a couple of ministries that uh, we just want to keep you updated on. Uh, so first, I'd like to welcome up Rose. We've been talking a lot over the last few months about a new ministry starting here called Oasis Ministries. So we have a little update from you. I'd like to welcome up Rose and a couple of her friends, and uh, she'll update us on what's going on with that. Good morning. So um, I'm here uh, uh, representing Oasis Ministry, and I have two precious friends, uh, Habiba and Unmi. So uh, I, we are here to just to give uh, is give thanks to God and to each one of you here as a church. Uh, for supporting us and for your care and your love. Like without God's grace and your support, Oasis Ministry would not have been existed. Uh, and for the people who uh, don't know about uh, Oasis, Oasis Ministry is uh, um, uh, a ministry that uh, uh, cares about newcomer friends and uh, uh, like to uh, greet them, receive them, and uh, support them in different ways, uh, like ESL classes and uh, showing love to them, um, making new relationships, um, helping them to settle down here in this beautiful city. And we have lots of stories, like we started, the uh, ministry was started on September 5th, and we are now just in our third week, and we have amazing stories. Maybe one day we would like to share share it with you, and um, uh, and one of the stories, um, a family from Iran came and um, a mom uh, and her daughter and her son-in-law, and uh, mom lives in another province, and the daughter and the son-in-law they are students here, and the, after like they um, they talk to us about their need, and then because of the love that they felt. They were overwhelmed, and the mom at the end of the meeting, she said to me, Rose, can you please pray for me so I can come and move to here? Like, she is, like they, they said, like we never experienced that much of love. So, and this is, is because of Jesus and because of all of you. And um, uh, so the goal of the ministry is to share Jesus' love with uh, our newcomer friends by helping them to settle down and um, create a new oasis for them. 
hope that one day they will experience Jesus' love too. There is a verse that says, though my father and mother forsaken me, the Lord will receive me. And so this is like the, the, any immigrant who comes to here, like he will come without a mom and dad, parents, relatives, their friends, but it will be so good if we can be the hands who will um, you know, embrace them, the heart who will love them, like we will be like God's hands, you know, and God's heart. We show them Jesus' love. So, um, uh, so now three weeks passed, and uh, as I told you, lots of good stories. And uh, the need, we need your love, we need your support, we need uh, lots of, you know, support. We need volunteers who can come beside us so we can, we all serve our newcomer friends in this city. You know, God is bringing the word to us by bringing people from different countries. So, and each one of you and us, we are missionaries, you know. So instead of going out, like this is a local, local mission. So, and uh, um, so we have peace, pieces here in our city from all over the world. And we have here, I'm from Syria, Habiba from Bangladesh, and Umi from um, South Korea. So, uh, so um, the need, I will just ask you this question. What do you think the need, your need will be when you move to a new country where you don't know anyone there? You have no idea about that country, about the system there. Maybe then when you <laughs> ask yourself this question, there will be lots of answers. That is the need that we need, like, to help our uh, newcomer friends. Um, and now I will uh, just uh, ask um, uh, Habiba, uh, what do you think, uh, well, Habiba, about this ministry? Why do you think it's very important? Or, like, can you tell us a little bit? Yeah. Thank you, Rose. So uh, before jumping into your answer, I would like to tell you that I'm Habiba Rashid. I came from Bangladesh. I, I'm enrolled in CNC, in accounting program. So the thing is, uh, uh, on arrival of my third day, I had encountered some bad experiences, and which was, I mean, uh, pretty close to death. And on the same day, I got to know Rose through Amber House. And uh, you know, I was pretty lost. Uh, I didn't know where, where, where to go, who to go, and what to do. Uh, so, uh, uh, she was uh, like there uh, to support me through all this. And till now she is like supporting me uh, to find a job, finding a, finding a rent, and finding anything to everything. So, I think uh, um, this is how the ministry can be helpful to a newcomer, so that they do not feel unwanted, unappreciated, and yeah, uh, in, in a new city. So I think uh, the work the was is doing is uh, really commendable. And yeah, I wish my both best wishes with the voices. Thank you. Thank you, Habiba. And now, Unmi. Yeah. Nice to meeting you. Uh, my name is Unmi Lee. Uh, I arrived here um, in January. Uh, my goal is uh, uh, studying English. Uh, I just stay in PC and Canada uh, just uh, two years and uh, six months to study. Uh, actually, my plan to go to Toronto, uh, my cousin li is leaving, but God changed everything. And before coming here, I got uh, God's answer. Uh, because uh, in South Korea, I majored in English literature, and I have been working in a high school for 25 years, and I decided to keep going, not retire, so I need to re-educate uh, re myself. In South Korea, we don't say any English, just reading and grammar. So as an English teacher, it was very hard to uh, say something in English, and uh, living as a foreigner is a very uh, huge difficult thing. 
because of stable life in just uh, homonized uh, Korean people. But here, as a foreigner, weaker. And PG, I didn't know before coming here, but uh, just uh, believed in God's plan and, uh, here. But I made many mistakes. And actually, in high school, we teach culture and literature. So I want to learn culture and literature too. And I'm a student at CNC. I'm 100% satisfied with the uh, study. And the professors are wonderful, uh, better than my imagination. But uh, the life is very tough. First thing is loneliness. Very, very lonely. Uh, I couldn't imagine that, that thing because my international uh, friends are very busy. They have to earn money for their living, but I get some support from government, so I have much time. And I have to learn uh, culture in two and a half years. But I don't have a friend. But uh, uh, I could come to Westwood Church uh, when I uh, participate in the service in the third time, uh, Andrew, the Kim's husband, talked to me and he introduced his wife Kim and uh, to me and Kim introduced me to Rose. So my wonderful life began. <laughs> and uh, I want to share uh, three or four things. I got blessed from Westwood Church from uh, the Oasis ministry. The first thing is, as I said, I, I hope to learn culture, local culture. Uh, so uh, I didn't say anything about my situation to Rose, but Rose every week called me, me every Saturday. We, have, uh, we will go to the uh, garage sale. Korea has no garage sale. <laughs> so will you come? So that day, in the summertime, I stayed in my home three or four days without talking anything. Sure, I will follow you. So uh, <laughs> Rose and Nae came to my house and uh, took me to the three or four garage sales every Saturday. It was a very interesting thing. I can share with my students <laughs> later. <laughs> and then. Uh, I didn't decide to buy a car because there are many, many problems can be possible. For example, two years after two years, I have to leave Korea, but nobody wants to buy my car. But these days, I thought, oh, oh already nine months passed and just 20 months left. Oh, Canada life is a very uh, big blessed from God, so I want to save time. So I just thought, because uh, buying a car is a very huge thing, but Rose, one day, last uh, two weeks ago, Rose just said to me, uh, the winter is coming. Uh, I think you do better buy a car. My, my story is so long. <laughs> 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 so. But I, I want to share with you because this is a very huge thing. <laughs> so, oh yeah, but uh, I just looking for the cars through the Facebook market, but oh, amazing thing happened. Well, I, uh, my major is two, English literature, and another thing is an online course, uh, psychology, and six courses, a very busy study. But Rose, uh, when I was studying at the CNC library, Rose called me. Uh, uh, first, first thing, uh, when I found a second-hand car, and I asked Rose, uh, and Rose asked Ben. Ben <laughs> so we went to the uh, second-hand car seller, but Ben checked everything and uh, this car is not good, the engine has uh, some noise, <laughs> so cancelled. And then um, Rose called me again, uh, Ben uh, found another good car, so we went there and 
I could buy a car. So save time and actually, I like studying. <laughs> Many Korean people like studying. So I, want to, I wanted to stay at CNC library and a computer lab uh, until 9.30. So at night time, very, uh, I, I felt scary, so I needed a car, so I could get a car. And then another thing, just, a, just a one minute, please. <laughs> another problem have, uh, happened. Um, when I went to the service to BC, uh, they asked me, um, Oh, no, insurance company uh, said you should pay $280 a month, but I didn't expect that. So I want to, so I brought some documents uh, to prove my uh, no accident for 20 years in South Korea, but Service BC didn't want uh, uh, record didn't uh, did recognize uh, my documents because the document style form is different. They want to know the starting point I drive, but Korean government doesn't say anything the starting point my drive. So I called to Kim. Kim had me just to let them read my documents. They don't want to, uh, they, and just to tell them my situation, Korean system, Canada system, different. They doesn't want to listen to me. So Kim came with me to the service BC, and Kim said, as my friend said, like a, a, a little bit strongly, they accept my situation, <laughs> so I could reduce the insurance fee from 280 to Miracle happened, 103. So, <laughs> so, so I, want to, I want to talk to you uh, why the OASIS ministry, uh, we need OASIS ministry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Unmi. Thank you, Habiba. Yes, so, you know, you know like, uh, we really need your support. And there is a table outside, um, like, maybe if you are interested, um, you can just give us your name, your email, and your phone number, so you can be um, part of this uh, ministry. We really need you. <laughs> and by the way, I, we took Unmi to many celebrations, like Canada Day, every, many, many places. But Unmi, I think she, the most she, uh, thing that she loved is garage sale, as me and Nael. <laughs> we like garage sales. Anyway, um, uh, I will share just, uh, sorry, Ryan, it was uh, <laughs> like uh, too long, but that's OK. <laughs> you have to get the. Uh, to be used to different cultures. <laughs> OK. Uh, so I will share from Matthew. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes uh, and clothes you? We did, um, when did we see you sick uh, or in prison to go and visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you, Rose. Um, as she said, there's a bit of a table with information out in the foyer if you wanna check in with her after the service today and uh, get to know her and see how you can help out. Uh, one really quick other announcement is uh, we have another uh, course starting up in a few weeks. So check out this video and then I'll just give a couple more details after that. 
I was a very aggressive individual. I hurt a lot of people because I was hurting inside. I, uh, I was driven by anger and committed crimes uh, motivated by, by that anger. I grew up not having the opportunity to share my feelings. I wasn't allowed to share my feelings because you do what you're told and you do it with your mouth shut. I would have my ideas and if you didn't fit into those ideas, well then, you know, we're, we're not meant to be friends. I've been alive 38 years and my father's told me he's loved me never. I would always say I didn't care, but deep down inside, I was a mess. I was always told you just, you just stay quiet and you know, what are people gonna think? Not having a voice did feel like I was invisible or like I, I really just didn't matter. I was always programmed to try to fix things. Here's your wife, you know, she's going through an unbelievable hard time and, you know, I just want to fix it, I just want to make it right. It has been transformational for me because putting everything together now gives me a desire to want this for my kids so that they don't have to go through whatever I went through. I want to master these skills because I want to walk in the full integrity of a Christian that's uh, spiritually and emotionally mature. To be able to listen to my wife, to be able also to look within myself, become not just you know, a better man, but a better husband. I'm beginning to realize that I have a voice and that above all, God hears that voice. It's not healthy to go through life bearing your emotions. Taking this class just helped me express it in a positive way. I have never known what it means to break down the skills that we need in order to love someone well. And the Emotionally Healthy Relationships course gave that to me. For me, that is absolutely life-changing. Awesome. So this is not the first time Westwood's offered this course, uh, but it is a highly beneficial course for anybody to take. You can take it again if you need to. Uh, so this course starts uh, in a few weeks on October 22nd, and it does have a max capacity of 40 participants. Uh, so if you're thinking about it or feeling that nudge, maybe don't wait too long to sign up. You can sign up on the website. There's more details on there. Um, but the ma or the Deadline to sign up is October 15th, so just keep some of those dates in your mind. Again, just check the website if you forget any of this. And uh, without further ado, Ryan Beer, everyone. Whoop. Wow, good morning, everyone. So uh, it's my joy to be back with you. Um, some of you may have noticed that I've been gone for a few months on sabbatical, so it's awesome to be back with you. If you want to hear more about what happened and what I did, you can talk to me another time. That's not why I'm up here this morning. Uh, but as uh, Corinne said, my name is Brian Beer, uh, and I'm the pastor of Go and Microchurches here. Go is our local and global mission stuff, uh, and microchurches are small expressions of the church that we really encourage people to be in at Westwood, as that's where we really experience the life of the church uh, in really deep and meaningful ways. And so if you're not in a microchurch, we'd love to talk to you about how to get into one. So this morning, though, we are continuing in our series in Thessalonians. And today, the passage I'm going to deal with in 1 Thessalonians 2 really deals with the motives for why we would share the gospel, why we would share the good news of Jesus. And so as we begin this morning, I want us to wrestle with this question. Why do motives matter? Why do they matter? Okay, so as we go along, I want you to keep this in the back of your head. Why do motives matter? All right? But before we do that, before we jump into answering that question, I want us to understand something that comes out in the first part of this passage, um, and that is this. It says it's that courage to share the message uh, of the gospel comes from the Holy Spirit. All right? So let's, let's jump in 1 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, you know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. 
So, you notice that Paul says that they faced strong opposition, but they dared to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus, because God gave them the strength and the courage to do that. Sometimes, this whole idea of sharing that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He came and lived among us, that He died and rose again and offers us new life, and and not just life, life, but abundant life in Him. Sometimes we fear sharing that with others, right? We think, oh, what what would they think of me, or how will they respond? And and it makes us a little bit fearful. It makes us a little bit of, we feel apprehension to do so. And so I want to encourage you, if that's you, if you've experienced that, if you're maybe currently experiencing that, to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you courage because it's such an important message that people need to experience the love of God in their lives. And we have a message that can open them up to experiencing that love of God in their lives. Um, And so if, if that is something that you wrestle with, something that you struggle with, fear of sharing the gospel, I would encourage you to pray and to ask the Holy Spirit for courage. But back then to our original question, why do motives matter? And specifically, we're talking about the motives of why we would want to share the gospel and why we would want to share what we believe with others and how we go about sharing our beliefs with others. And I would posit to you today that this, this is why it matters. If you're not aware of what this image is, this is an image taken at a residential school. And the first time I saw this, I wept. Look what it says. That's First Nations people writing on a chalkboard in a residential school. And look what it says. Looking unto Jesus. That is not what Jesus looks like. That's not what Jesus looks like. Jesus does not look like ripping kids away from their family. and trying to take away their culture and make them like another culture, subjecting them to all kinds of awful conditions and abuses. That does not look like Jesus. And it breaks my heart that the name of Jesus was associated with that. It grieves me deeply that this took place and that the church played a significant role in it. And so this weekend in Canada as we had Truth and Reconciliation Day yesterday, I want to say that this is the kind of thing that happens when we get the motive wrong and is, should show to us why the motive matters deeply. Because here's the reality, the why always affects the how. The why always affects the how. The why we feel like we should do something affects the how we go about doing it. And so if the motive isn't the motive that Paul is going to put forward for sharing the good news of Jesus, then the how that's gone about will not align with Jesus 
and his love and his message of love and peace and freedom. So then, back to our question. But with a little bit of a different twist on it, what should the motive be then? What should the motive be? Well, let's go back to this passage of Scripture and have a look. Let's, let's continue reading. Paul, first of all, is going to share a few things of what the motive shouldn't be, and we'll get into that in a minute. But then he shares what his motive was and what the motive should be. Let's read together. Let's pick it up in verse 3. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We are not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring, caring for her little children. Listen to this. Here's the motive coming out right here. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Because you had become so dear to us. Brothers and sisters, this morning, I want to posit to you that the motive should always be love. If we're going to share this message with people, it should be out of love for them, out of love for our neighbors, out of love for our city, out of love for our friends and family. And it should be accompanied by action. Scripture is quite clear that love is a verb. It's meant to be shown in our actions, how we go about living our lives. Rose uh, just referenced Matthew 25, and Jesus talks about those that know him are going to live out tangible ways of love, of caring for people, especially the most vulnerable. And Paul, in one of my favorite passages of Scripture, he spells it out in another area even more about how important the motive of love is. In 1 Corinthians 13, he says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm just making noise. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Nothing. The motive should always be love. And if you want to greater understand what that love looks like, I encourage you when you go home today to continue to read the rest of 1 Corinthians 13 because that is a description of what God's perfect love looks like. And he calls us to seek to love people in the same way. So then, if love is the right motive, let's examine some that aren't. Let's examine some that aren't. Impure motives. First one that Paul references is people-pleasing. He says, we didn't share the gospel to please man, but to please God right? I don't do it because I think, yeah, if I share the gospel, you know, maybe my pastor will be happy with me, or, you know, I can go share it at small group, and they'll be like, good job, you did it, um, or 
It's not about people pleasing. And besides, let's face it, people pleasing is a fool's errand. It never works out. You can never please everybody, can you? Because people, there'll be people, I mean, if you go on Twitter, which I guess now is called X, you can be on there for 30 seconds and realize that people do not agree on a whole lot, and sometimes vehemently so, and sometimes nastily so, actually. <laughs> um, so you can't please everybody. It's an impossibility. So people-pleasing is not a good motive for sharing the gospel of Jesus and what he came and did. It's not where our motives should lie. The second one is greed. Greed. When we see the gospel as a means to manipulate people to gain money, or we accept money like the church did from the government to participate in residential schools, when greed becomes a motive, we get off track. Or another great example is some of uh, these televangelists that we see that have a fleet of their own private jets while peddling the gospel for profit. Look at me. I'm a rock star. It's all about me. Greed, using the gospel as a means to manipulate people so that you can gain your own wealth, not the right motive either. The third one, seeking to gain power, right? Often, when the church throughout history has made its most grievous mistakes, it is when we have sought to align ourselves with power so that we can then force upon others to live according to the morality that we think they should. Residential schools, the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, we can go on. When the church seeks power so that we can impose what we think and what we believe on others, we often go astray. And not to mention that it's not the Jesus way. I mean, look at Matthew 4. Look at Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 when he's tempted by the devil. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 4. Again, this is verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he says, all this I will give to you. I will give you all this political power. All the kingdoms will be yours, Jesus, if you just bow down to me. And Jesus says, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then... Jesus goes on to go to the cross and to serve others. Jesus shows a new way, a way of love, a way of sacrificial love. Rather than chasing and seeking power, he chose to serve even to the point of death on a cross. And he sets a new way for how disciples should live. Not by seeking to gain power over others, but to serve, to seek, to love and serve others. The Jesus way 
is not to seek power and then impose your will on others. The Jesus way is to love others into the kingdom and to serve others in ways that people go, this is not normal. People do not, most people are not this generous. Most people are not this loving. There is something different going on here. That's the Jesus way. Showing people a different way of living. Another not such good motive is trying to conform people to our cultural biases. Let's, let's be honest, we all have cultural biases, things that we're conditioned to think are the right way of going about things because that's the way we've always done them growing up in whatever culture we've grown up in, right? It's why uh, when, when uh, Rose was up here and they were joking about time, right? When I lived in Kenya, they had an expression. They said, uh, you have the watch, but we have the time. And the, and the joke was, you crazy North American people are all about the watch and scheduled, but you have no time for each other, and we do, right? It's not that our way of everything by the schedule and clock is the right way. It's one way, and it might be our cultural preference, as I found out in Kenya sometimes when things were running significantly behind what I thought they should be. But conforming people to our cultural bias is not the point of the gospel. Sometimes in missions, we have gone out and we have tried to lead people not just to Jesus, but to be North American. Be like us. This is the best way. Be like us. And we've done tremendous damage. Instead of recognizing that every culture in the world shows us something beautiful about God. And, and exemplifies his character in some way. Uh, part of uh, my sabbatical, I spent six weeks with my family traveling around uh, Thailand and Vietnam. And one of the questions I would ask my boys as we were traveling was, what about Thai culture? What about Vietnamese culture? Have you noticed points you to the character of God? And, and, and they would think about it, and they would have different answers, and we would just talk about that. Like, in what way does this culture reflect Jesus? And maybe in a way that you didn't think about in just your North American context. And we'd wrestle with that, because every culture, every person is made in the image of God, so every culture in some way is going to reflect God. doesn't mean that there aren't things about Every culture that also don't reflect God and don't align with Jesus, of course there is. But seeking to conform people to our culture is not the point. Seeking to see how we might contextualize the gospel for a culture is. And the last one is spiritual pride. And this is what Jesus was constantly blasting the Pharisees about. They thought because they had the right beliefs and the right ideas and did the right practices that they were better than everybody else. If only you could be like me. This idea of spiritual pride. I'm right. You're wrong. You need to be more like me. And that doesn't look like Jesus either. Blaise Pascal said this. He said, men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction. Paul writes about how it's okay to be zealous, but be zealous for the right things. To be zealous, to be able to be zealous about sharing the good news of Jesus isn't a bad thing, but make sure your motives are pure. 
so that we don't fall into this trap. Because fear, fear was never meant to be a way to turn people towards Jesus. In fact, Scripture says that perfect love, which is the love of God, casts out all fear. So using fear to manipulate people towards the gospel, that's not the way to go about it. The reality is this. If we know Jesus and his love, we will want others to experience it. Because we know how it's transformed our own lives. And we want other people to experience that same transformation in theirs. We are to be messengers of hope, encouragers and comforters who love others well. So, let me leave you, as, as the worship team comes, let me leave you with a few questions to wrestle with. First is this, what are your motives for wanting others to believe what you believe? And Andy Andy Stanley, I love what he says when he's talking about examining motives. He says, to ask yourself, why do I want to do that or why did I do that? And then he says, and then stop yourself and ask yourself, no, why did I really want to do that or why did I really do that? Because often we'll come up with all kinds of great ways to justify our impure motives. So stop and ask Jeff, no, why? Why do I really want to do that? Or why did I really do that? Second thing I want you to ask yourselves is, what are you a messenger of? Both in your actions and your words, what are you a messenger of? Does the message that you're portraying in the way you live and the things you say, does it portray the message of hope, the message of Jesus and his gospel? Are you living a life that exemplifies the love of Jesus? Are you joining Jesus in seeking the shalom? Remember, the shalom is like this peace, this, but it's, it's more than just peace. It's like this holistic human thriving in those he has placed in your life. And finally, What would it look like to make the most of the opportunities God has given you for the sake of seeking shalom? This morning as we close and uh, as the worship team then is going to lead us uh, uh, in worship, just reflect on on these questions prayerfully and ask God to give you a love for others that exemplifies the same love that he has for them. And as an act of reconciliation, I'm going to close with this. Normally, traditionally, you would start with this. But I just want to acknowledge that I live, work, and play on the unceded ancestral lands of the Clay Laytonae as an act of reconciliation, I want to leave us with that land acknowledgement. Let's sing and worship Jesus together.